afternoon. Uh, welcome back to the Scheifele Lecture Series, which is funded by the Class of 50 Museum Endowment in recognition of the significant contribution made to the endowment by the Scheifele Trust. Vice Admiral Ralph Scheifele was a highly decorated naval aviator, a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, Class of 1933. He was designated a naval aviator in 1937. He participated in World War II operations against the Japanese at New Guinea, Saipan, Guam, the Palaos, and the Philippines, and was awarded the Navy Cross and Distinguished Flying Cross. Now, to introduce our guest speaker today is a little difficult uh, to try to truncate his incredible career. Commander Yusef Abul Inayn is a U.S. Navy Medical Service Corps, Corps Commander, Middle East Foreign Area Officer, and is the author of Militant Islamist Ideology, Understanding the Global Threat, and Iraq in Turmoil, Historical Perspectives of Dr. Ali al Wardi, From the Ottomans to King Faisal, and co-author of The Secret War for the Middle East, The Influence of Axis and Allied Intelligence Operations During World War II. Commander Abul Inai served as Country Director for North Africa and Egypt, Assistant Country Director for the Arabian Gulf, and Special Advisor on Islam Islamist Militancy at the Office of the Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. He currently serves as Senior Counterterrorism Advisor and Subject Matter Expert on Militant Islamic Ideology at Defense Combating uh, Terrorism Center, formerly the, uh, Joint Terror excuse me, the Joint Intelligence Task Force for Combating Terrorism, JIT. He also served as an expert witness in the recent trial of Private Manning. He earned a BA from the University of Mississippi, an MBA and Master's in Health Services Administration from the University of Arkansas, an MS in Strategic Intelligence from the National Intelligence University, as well as an MS in National Resource Strategy from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Please help me in welcoming Commander Abul Inar. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute delight to be here. I almost forgot my, the main purpose of my visit, looking at the wonderful exhibits here. It's absolutely delightful to be here. Uh, what I hope to do today is to discuss with you my first book that went, went paperback in September, Militant Islamist Ideology. I published it in 2010. And uh, basically, um, uh, there are two extremes of the debate about what to do regarding violent Islamist groups here in the United States. Two extremes. Listen, America is a free country. You're welcome to those extreme opinions. I get it. But in my world, in the world of analysis, in the world of providing options, it's analytically worthless. And you know those two extremes. On the one hand, Islam is evil. That's 1.5 billion people. That's one-fifth of humanity. Totally worthless. OK. On the other ex extreme, you may have heard of Islam is peace, right? That's also analytically worthless. Because if you live in those two worlds, you can't really understand the nuance and complexity needed to operate in the globe today, and particularly in addressing this particular problem set. So after talking to thousands of soldiers and sailors, and airmen deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan, they asked me a simple question. They said, sir, how do we characterize the threat? Can't we have a, a, a common language in discussing the threat without hysteria, is what they were asking for. They were asking me for language. Another thing they were asking was, is when the president at the time, President Bush, would say they've hijacked a great religion, what does that mean? How does that, how does that get done, you see? And these are the big questions I'm trying to answer in militant Islamist ideology. Like, for instance, if you live in those two extremes, you can't understand, for instance, that, uh, uh, f that the importance that in information sharing with our Muslim partners and allies and, and friends of convenience are in combating terrorism. You can't even enter that world if you have these kind of value judgments because we need various partners in the region to combat terrorism. You won't understand, for instance, that when, when militant Islamists want to say that they want to impose an Islamic social order or an Islamic government, well, okay, great. The question is, if you look at my diagram, and this is not an exhaustive diagram, with 1.5 billion people, who's Islam? Do you think everyone agrees on what constitutes Islamic law among 1.5 billion people? Or does that basically defy the human condition, you see? So what I did was, is I created a model. I'm not in love with the model, but it's a model to reduce complexity, you see, to give us the basis to have this discussion without hysteria. And what I did was, 
is I said, you have to disaggregate militant Islamists from Islamists. That IST matters, language matters. And those two from Islam, all right? So it's not like a soldier, a Marine, or sailor, or airman has a joint pub. You know, we love our joint pubs, right? So what is a militant Islamist, sir? So I have to define it in my book. I have to offer a precise definition. A militant Islamist is someone who is attempting to impose an Islamic social order or Islamic government in their image on Muslims and non-Muslims alike through violent means or conspiracy to commit an act of violence. Ladies and gentlemen, I spend 80% of my day worrying about that genre, countering that genre, okay? So what's an Islamist? An Islamist has various notions of what an Islamic social order should look like in their respective images. And they vary, and they fight, and there's schisms over what that order should look like, even amongst themselves. But it's typically characterized, or, one, or typically wanted to be imposed, through nonviolent means. See, that's the distinction. But even then, we need precision in language. In my business, counterterrorism, what does nonviolent means, what is that actually, how, do, how, is, what is that, how is that defined? Well, on the extreme end of nonviolence, it could be someone cheerleading Al Qaeda on a website, right? You've seen that, right? But they haven't made the tangible leap to what? Conspiracy, or support the conspiracy to commit violence. They may bear occasional watching, because they can morph, but they don't bear the kind of scrutiny you would on an act of conspiracy, you see? That's on the extreme end. On the liberal side of Islamist, and liberal is a relative term here, you have the Turkish AKP. That is an Islamist political party. It's an Islamist political party that has succeeded in being reelected a third time, so they're taking Turkey to its second decade in power, and they're experiencing what you find in democracies, democratic overreach. Are you familiar with that? Now that you've been elected a third time, you feel kind of politically comfortable, right? So it's time to basically impose a moral-based, impose moral-based legislation. Because I'm politically comfortable. I've been elected a third time. I can do those things. But what's hap what happens when you attempt to impose a moral-based legislation? You get what's happening in Istanbul in Gizeh Park with these protests, you see. And of course, you've got Islam, 1.5 billion people with various notions. There's another thing, too, about my book, whether you attend my electives at the National Defense University or you read my book. We're going to talk about religion, but we're going to talk about religion historically, not theologically. There's a difference. What I mean by that is we're going to delve into mythology and logic. That's a tension in every religion. The bridge is faith. That's not my business. I'm not in the faith business. Okay, and the reason we do that is so we can understand the origins of ideas, you see. And we can have that candid conversation. Another thing, too, you can't hope to understand Islam without understanding that it is part of the Abrahamic tradition of faiths. Okay? So that means that it, there's certain idiosyncrasies with the Abrahamic faiths. Okay? Certain idiosyncrasies. All three of the Abrahamic faiths has a chosen people narrative. That doesn't go away. All right? It doesn't matter how many bin Ladens you kill, how Lakis you kill. That narrative does not go away. Why go to mosque? Why go to ch synagogue? Why go to church? Why fast? Why do those things? Unless there's an elaborate chosen people narrative to make it worthwhile. All right? In the case of Islam and Christianity in particular, less so in Judaism, all right? One idiosyncrasy is proselytizing. Now, I don't care if you're Christian or Muslim. When does the proselytizing end? Who has to show up? Chaplain, can you help me with that? Messiah. That's right. Who is that if you're Christian or Muslim? Jesus. It is. Now, when he shows up, he's cheering the home team, right? That's the chosen people narrative again. That doesn't go away, you see. That's just the human condition, what we're working in. Now. Another thing, too, to understand is that basically when you want to impose an Islamic social order in your image, let's talk about some of the practical problems with this. For those of you that may have deployed to Afghanistan, 
One of the main reasons the Taliban fell so quickly, one of the many reasons that they fell so quickly is when they attempted to create their Islamic Emirate in 1996, they had to decide on who's Islam. This is the old question. How do I render the divine to the day-to-day -day practical? Are we all going to, in this room going to agree on, on that? Or are we going to have disagreements about that? You see? So what they did was, is obviously they, 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 they're Sunnis, but that's not good enough. You've got to go deeper. Hanbali, because there's a cacophony within Sunni Islam of various menhaj or interpretations. And then you have to go deeper. They're Salafis. Now, of course, Salafi means return to the pious founders. Do Salafis agree on who the pious founders are and how to emulate those pious founders? Well, of course not. That's why there's hundreds of groups. Welcome to the human condition, right? So what they did is they basically selected North Indian Diobandism and Saudi Wahhabism, amalgamated that, but there's one missing ingredient, Pashtun Wali. Because you don't check your identity at the door, right? You don't check your tribalism at the door. They infuse that, and that became the basis of their state. Now, if you've deployed to Afghanistan, you know that's a big problem. Because for instance, up north, 30% of the country are Hazara Shiites. They don't want to live under this system. They don't want to live under that. And they're Muslims. Okay? If you don't care about the Shiites, let's say we're Taliban or Sunni, we don't care about the Shiites. You know, some radical Sunnis don't care about the Shiites. Then, okay, great. Most Sunnis in Afghanistan are Hanafi. You see? And you understand some of the schisms even within the Taliban. Because you had the Taliban saying, I'll be darned if I'm going to have a foreign fighter tell me how to practice my faith. These are the kinds of schisms that you begin to understand and begin to appreciate, you see. Now, uh, another issue too is, is we, we, 80 percent of Muslims are Sunni, 20 percent are Shia, 20 percent are Shia. And uh, uh, even though the Shia are 20%. I can't help the historic cards dealt the United States of America in the 21st century. They occupy areas of strategic interest to the United States. Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, you see. 60% of Iraq is Shia. 90% of Iran is Shia. 70% of Bahrain, where Fiflid is, is Shia, you see. But just like in Sunni Islam, there's a cacophony. You have a cacophony of Shia. Okay, everything from who's the last imam, last imam to go into occultation, and by the way, these Shia imams have a job to do, usher in a period of peace and justice, and usher in and pave the way for the second coming, you see, for the second coming. So there's disagreements on who's the last imam. There's, of course, disagreements over how to practice Shiism. But the majority of Shiites in Iran, for instance, are 12 Shiites. But to understand the origins of ideas, and we get back to this issue of studying religion historically, not theologically, you understand, for instance, that the Shia, first of all, in the Arabic language, between 661 and 680 AD, you had in the Arabic language, Shia Mu'awiyah, partisans of Mu'awiyah, Shia Ali, partisans of Ali. Okay, and the Shia Ali became what? the Shiites that we know today. But it would take decades, if not centuries, for the Shiites to evolve orthopraxy and orthodoxy to distinguish themselves from whom? Sunnis, you see. I'm gonna give you just a, a, a taste. For instance, one main difference among 12 Shiites and Sunnis is you, that uh, 12 Shiites believe that there are 12 Imams. Imams, these are not prayer leaders. These are descendants of Muhammad from Fatima and Ali. They are supposed to be masum, infallible, immaculate from sin. Hey, I've heard that story before. And you're not good enough to talk to God. You have to engage in tawasul. In other words, these 12 imams will be intercessors between you and God. And they make up the 14 infallible ones, which is Muhammad, Fatima, and the 12 imams. Hey, wait a minute, I've seen this numbers game before. You know, Jesus marrying the 12 apostles. You see, is that a coincidence? But see, when you study religion historically, not theologically, you understand the origins of ideas and the importance and the impact 
of Christian theosophy and Judaic theosophy on Islam. Like, for instance, why do you think we have Jesus' narratives in the Quran that you don't find in the New Testament? Did that come, you know, in a vacuum? And the reason I say that is so you can empathize, not sympathize, empathize with the region. Well, to understand that, we have to actually go away from Muhammad's period, 570 to 632 AD, and we have to go back to two dates, really, that are very important in Christianity, 315 and 325 AD. What happened in 315 AD? Constantine embraced Christianity. And in 325 AD, you had what? The Council of Nicaea, the first of eight ecumenical councils that would give form to what we understand as Christianity today, the, the first century, okay? As we understand Christianity today, eight ecumenical councils. Now, of course, each council would issue an edict. And what, is e what do edicts typically produce, aside from doctrine? You get what? Dissenters, all right? Now, you think these dissenters just go away? Enjoy being labeled heretics by fellow Christians? No. Some of them actually would migrate to Arabia and migrate to Persia. And they would influence the monotheistic ideas of the region. By the time Muhammad comes in 570 AD, you have certain narratives that are prevalent, you see. On the one hand, you have, for instance, uh, an, that people that tended to monotheism in pre-Islamic Arabia would say, well, when the, Old Te when the New Testament said that, or uh, the Old Testament said that uh, Ishmael is going to be the founder of many nations, well, who's that supposed to be? The Arabs. Well, wait a minute. If we're supposed to be descendants of Abraham through Ishmael, then why haven't we been given a prophet to teach us monotheism in the Arabic language? I mean, hey, I'm not, I'm not arguing the validity of the narrative or not, but the narrative is there, you see. So by the time Muhammad comes along, you have a certain I, I, storm of ideas that propel him from 570 to 632 AD, you see. Why haven't we given a prophet to, the, uh, to, teach us, uh, to teach us monotheism in the Arabic language? Another uh, issue has nothing to do with, with, uh, uh, with uh, religion per se, but has to do with social justice and the abandonment of a pre-Islamic tribal code called Muruwa, where you made provisions for the orphan and the widow. What was Muhammad? He was an orphan, you see. But you had a generation of Meccans who argued with their fathers and forefathers, why have you abandoned this code of chivalry, this code of Muruwa? in favor of abject exploitation of the widow, of the slave, of the orphan, you see. Um, another thing, too, to understand is basically, uh, uh, basically th there are other models that I cover in my book. This is one that I find prevalent among Arabic writers, all right, and it primarily deals with uh, violent Sunni Islamists, violent Sunni Islamists. And their model is, is you have to disaggregate Salafi ilmi, Salafi ikhwani, Salafi jihadi. So what is that? There's hundreds of Salafi groups, right? Salafi ilmi. Salafi ilmi basically is what, is what we would call a benign proselytizing Salafi. In other words, leave me alone. I don't want to participate in politics. Leave me alone. Okay, I just want to imp impose my Salafism on my wives and my daughters, and through my example and proselytizing, I will change society. Okay, Salafi Ikhwani. He would say to the ilmi, that's not good enough. If you want to bring about change, you better get politically organized. Form a political party. Compete in elections. Get a seat at the table. I'll leave you alone on one condition, Salafi Ilmi. Can I have your vote? You see, these are your political activists. And by the way, not to be confused with another Islamist organization, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, which I'll get to. Even though, because the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, the reason I say that is in Arabic, the Muslim Brotherhood is Al Ikhwan al Muslimin, or the Ikhwan. This is, this is actually more. I should say, fundamentalist and conservative than the, than the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafi Ikhwani. But they want to achieve their objectives through political 
organizing, political participation, if you will. Salafi Jihad, well, that should be self-evident. I mean, this is Arabic language. Salafi Jihad, they said to the Ilmi, what is this? Leave me alone. How feeble, how weak. You know, that's not acceptable. And you Ikhwani guys, what are you doing? Participating in the democratic process. Don't you know that's apostasy? What are you doing? The only way we're going to bring about change is through direct violent acts, you see. Now, why does this model matter? Aside from the fact that it appears in Arabic publications and among Arabic commentators on counterterrorism, okay, do you think these three groups like each other? They're schisms, you see. And in this case, the ilmi, and the ilmi doesn't like the jihadi because the ilmi says the jihadi spoils the proselytizing environment. Okay? And the Ikhwani doesn't like the jihadi. Why? Because they're spoiling what? The political environment. The campaigning environment. You see, these schisms matter in the 21st century when you're trying to uh, basically under uncover plots. You see. I'm not a fan of either of their political philosophy or views. Okay? But that's the world we're living in, you see. We can choose to engage with the world as we want it to be or as it is. The choice is up to you, you see. That's the basis of my book. Now, Muslim Brotherhood. The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, um, how many of you have heard that it's a violent organization? I have. Sure, I have. Now, the, was it violent? Sure. It had a violent phase. But in 21st century CT analysis, when it comes to violent Islamists, that's not good enough. You, you can't just freeze an organization in time. All right? For instance, let's take the, take the Muslim Brotherhood as a case example. In 1928, Hassan al-Banna starts it out as a social organization to mainly deal with uh, laborers who are dredging the Suez Canal. Dirty and their families. Dirty, nasty, irregular paid work where you're treated basically like abject slaves, modern day abject slaves. That's how he starts the Society of the Muslim Brothers. And he actually models it after the YMCA. I wish I could make this up, but he, ma he models it after the YMCA to provide these kind of social services. All right. And from 1928 to 1932, he would carry on like this. By 1932, uh, he uh, enters the political sphere. So now he goes from social to what? Socio-political Islamist organization. All right, from 1932 to 1942, he would try to engage in the political process openly. But there's a problem, okay? The problem is, is you can't play Egyptian politics during World War II and before unless you're cognizant of a European fad wafting into the Middle East and into Egypt. And what was that? Fascism. Fascism. You don't think uh, Americans were the only ones, there's some Americans that were infected by that bug, right? If you read your history. Well, Egypt wasn't immune either. Infected by this bug of fascism. What does that mean on the ground? Well, if the Muslim Brothers are going to compete against Mr. Fatat, the young Egyptians, marching around in their green shirts, right? To take off of what? Mussolini's black shirts. If you're going to compete politically in the 1930s and 1940s in Egypt, you better have your bully boys there with you. You see? Otherwise, you're not in the game. So he would be in that environment, and he would create his own group of bully boys. By 1942, you have a situation where you have a quasi-regime change that occurs in Egypt, where an emergency wartime government is dictated to by, by, to, dictated to by King Farouk, basically by Sir Miles Lamson, the British ambassador, to King Farouk at the point of a tank barrel. An emergency war is imposed on Egypt. So what do you think, what, what do you think? this humiliates the army, right? A young major, Nasser, creates the free officers after that, after that incident, called the Sir Miles Lamson incident. And Hassan al-Banna creates what? His uh, uh, Jihaz al-Khas special apparatus. 
a group of assassins and thugs that mainly target pro-British politicians. And it enters its violent phase. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that violent phase would last until really about 1971. Well, what happened? In 1970, Nasser dies of a stroke, of a heart attack. Okay, Sadat, who had only been vice president for less than two years, is now the president. He's considered at that time a weak candidate, someone that ha has huge shoes to fill when it comes to Nasser. A lot of people underestimated Sadat. Sadat had it, his main threat were from Nasserists and leftists. So what he did was, is he clung to, the, to basically Islamist politics. He reinvented himself using Islamist politics, calling himself, for instance, President of the Faithful. Or what he does is, is in order to deal with the streets, because you can't rely on the police, you can't rely on the army, they're all Nasserists. You see, you can't even criticize Nash. His body isn't even cold yet. So what do you do? You open the jails. Those thousands of Muslim Brotherhood that had been jailed by Nasser from 1954 to 1970, you let them out of the jails. Give them amnesty, you see. And during this environment, in 1971, the Supreme Guide of the Muslim Brotherhood basically begins to bring it to its violent, its nonviolent phase, albeit illegal. It's an illegal political party, but it's a nonviolent phase. And that would last, ladies and gentlemen, until when? You know the story. You watch the news like I did. Until when? Tahrir Square, January 25th, 2011. You see? So, and now, you've got a, a new situation now. When you see the world this way, you can begin to analyze what's going on. What's going on? How many of you have heard the term Arab Street? Have you? The Arab Street? Arab yeah, the Arab Street. You know, this kind of nebulous, amorphous kind of blob, of the Arab Street. Well, in our business, that's not good enough. Okay, you have to, if, you, if you're gonna, if you're gonna work for a guy like me, you're gonna have to go back and tell me who's on the street. You see? And but more importantly, after you've identified that, tell me, after that despot topples, are they still going to be friends? Or are they going to be at each other? You see. But to say Arab Street, in my, in my view, is an intellectual cop-out. All right. How many of you have dabbled in the French Revolution? Anyone? French Revolution? Did we ever say the French Street? Or did you say the Girondins, the Jacobins, Barras faction, Ma's faction? So why do you think the Arab Street's any different? You see? We need this so you can understand when they're protesting in front of our embassy in Cairo in December 2012, September, I'm sorry, 2012, who's out there? Who are the factions? How'd this faction form? How'd this mob form? Who formed it? Who's paying? Understand the mechanics. Is it really about the American embassy? Or is it about uh, embarrassing the government in power? You see. And then you can begin to compare Cairo to, say, for instance, events in Benghazi, for instance, as an example. Compare and contrast the two to understand it with some precision, you see. Now, uh, another thing, too, is let's, I want to turn to Shiism a little bit. An example of Islamic governance. Why, why is Islamic governance something that is debatable among Muslims? We have to understand something. In 632 AD, Muhammad dies, right? Prophet Muhammad dies. But, and we all know, if you take an Islam 101, that he hasn't, he didn't clearly designate a successor. He didn't clearly designate a successor. That's one of the reasons you have this schism between Sunni and Shia. But what you may not know is that there is nothing in the Quran, considered the book of divine revelation for Muslims, or the hadiths, these are sayings attributed to Prophet Muhammad, that ordain how Muslims are to govern themselves. Like for instance, the Quran says you have to have adl, justice. All right? You have to have shura, consultation. And you have to have wali al amr, some head guy in charge of whatever structure you decide to bring about those two co generalized concepts in the Quran justice and consultation. 
Now, how do you achieve justice? How do you, what mechanism? What institutions? You can't find that in the Quran. How do you achieve consultation? You can't find that in the Quran or the Hadith. So what does that mean? Much like in Christianity, all of these institutions and orthopraxy and orthodoxy are developed what? After the death of the prophet in question. In other words, apocryphal. You see, it's apocryphal. Let me give you an example of what that means. For instance, when, you, when militant Islamists say, some of them, and some Islamists say, I want to reestablish the caliphate. You heard that one, right? All right. So the question then is, if the Quran has nothing about the caliphate, and the hadiths have nothing about the caliphate, what is the caliphate? Is it, is it ordained in Islam? I mean, the Muslim Islamists tell you it's ordained. Or is it political tradition? Like, for instance, Abu Bakr, the first guy to succeed Muhammad, he called, they, were, he, they named him Khalifa Rasulullah, successor to the Prophet. That's what he was. He succeeded the Prophet. That's where you get the word caliph from, successor. You know, your XO is your Khalifa, your successor. Okay. Now, Omar, the second caliph arrives. Second caliph. And Omar, it's not like he can say, I'm the successor to the successor of the Prophet, right? It's kind of a mouthful. It's not like he can say I'm a successor to Abu Bakr. After all, Omar was the kingmaker. He made Abu Bakr. He cajoled. He argued. He had the kind of political wherewithal to posture Abu Bakr to become that first caliph. When you study these people as human beings, they're amazing human beings. Rich individuals, you see, instead of rightly guided. When they're rightly guided, they're semi-divine, right? You see. So, Omar, his com people around him started calling him uh, Amir al-Mu'minin, commander of the faithful. By the time you get to the uh, uh, Umayyad period, you get things like shadow of God on earth. Now, wait a minute. How do you think early Muslims felt about these highfalutin titles? Went against their desert kind of egalitarian mindset, didn't it? You see, outrageous. You see, but what happens? These institutions become what? They're developed afterwards and are apocryphal. It's a political tradition. Now, let me give you an example from Shiism. The Islamic Republic of Iran. Is that Islamic government? What do you think? Who said that? Who said yes? Well, uh, the Supreme Leader would agree with you. Ahmed Jadi would agree with you. After all, uh, the, 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 the answer is dependent. Of their, their, their positions are dependent on the answer, right? You see. To answer that question with any precision, I cover that in my chapter in my book, is you have to delve into Khomeini's writings, you see. Particularly his book published in Najaf, which is a collection of his sermons on politics, called Hukumat al-Islami, or, Islamic, or Islamist, Islamic, Islamist Polity. Islamic polity. And in it, basically, he says, an Islamic government is one in which you have the rule of supreme jurist, wilayat al faqih supreme jurist. And, there, and the, the job of that supreme jurist is to guide the moral course of the state with the help of a council of clerics. OK? Now, if you've studied your classics, eerily familiar, isn't it? Where else have you heard similar notions? Plato's Republic. Philosopher kings who guide the moral course of the perfect hypothetical city-state. OK? Who studied Plato's Republic as preserved by Al-Farabi? Because you have to understand, Arabs, Muslims, preserved the Greek and Roman classics and made it a gift to the Renaissance. You gotta live it, leave us something constructive to be proud of. All right? Otherwise, you're just helping bin Laden, right? Someone like bin Laden says, oh, these are Hellenized Muslims. You know, the people that brought you algebra, alchemy, you see. And of course, when you do that, you basically, typically, people, to make that fit, you go basically from the Romans to the Renaissance. Well, there's centuries gap there. You got an airbrush. There's, 
you see. You've got to do some airbrushing. So basically, what you, Khomeini synthesized. He took aspects of Plato. He took aspects of a, a guy named Ibn Taymiyyah and his writings on polity. Although he was a, Ibn Taymiyyah was rapidly anti-Shia, but he, he was attracted to Ibn Taymiyyah's write, writings on polity. And he synthesized it into something new. That's why when you understand that, then you understand the debates between Ayatollahs over Khomeinias. You see? And you can begin to understand the fight over who is going to be defining Khomeini's legacy. That's what the 2009 election was about. You see? Is it about guiding the moral course of the state? Or is it about direct executive rule of the state? That's the crux of the 2009 election. You see? So it wasn't about regime change. It's about where do we go from here? There's a constructive direction and a much more radical, much more regressive direction. You see, that's the kind of nuance we need to begin to unpackage the complexity of the region, even more so in the post-Arab Spring Middle East. We need this nuance, you see. And we need empathy. Empathy so we can uh, uh, understand the cacophony of debates. Which Let me leave you one more idea about cacophony. Militant Islamists hate the cacophony. You see, in their world, they want to impose one narrative. Well, obviously, that's a pipe dream, because you've got 1.5, one-fifth of humanity. It's a pipe dream, you see. Like, for instance, when they develop a, uh, when they develop a, uh, a uh, operative, OK, they typically say, don't worry about, I'm going to pick on you, sir, don't worry about the infidel. Don't worry about them. Worry about the apostate. The hypocrite. He's worse. Now, why do you think they say that? Because they know that when they go out into the city or into the town, they're going to be hit with a what? A tidal wave of cacophony, various notions of Islamic narratives. And that may dissuade them from what? From going to Kashmir? From fighting with the Taliban? You see? To give you a more precise art, and, and even. In my business, we get down in the weeds. And what I mean by that, for instance, is uh, uh, Ayman al Zawahri, for instance. There's a guy by the name of Imam al Sharif. That's Zawahri's mentor. I mentioned him in my book. Zawahri's mentor. And uh, this guy is not a fan of the United States. All right, all right, let's just get it, let's go from the get go, okay? But what I like about Imam al Sharif is he's written four books attacking Zawahri and bin Laden when he was alive, using this kind of Salafi jihadi language, you see. So let me give you a taste of what he says. He says, for instance, all Al-Qaeda is, is the cult of bin Laden and Zawahri. Every suicide bombing is designed to do two things, media and money. It's not about God. It's not about caliphate. It's not about something higher. And that's Zawahri's mentor saying that. Someone who, an important ideologue within Al Qaeda, saying that. Zawahri, you know how Zawahri reacts? Zawahri says, I, don't rea I didn't realize they had uh, fax machines next to the electric torture machines in Egyptian prisons. He's dismissive. But after a while, he realizes he has to what? Rebut this. OK, I'm done with the name calling, right? Now you, got, you still have the argument. That hasn't gone away, right? So what does he do? He publishes a 300-page rebuttal called the exoneration. You see, that's the kind of nuance that's needed to understand what's going on in the region. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us again, and our next event will be on December 2nd when we welcome Admiral McKnight, and he'll be talking about...